feminism is that they don't play this sexually conservative game how for a woman to defend herself, which brings the impression as if women really don't want sex, only exceptionally sex is always preferred. I read wonderful Spanish from Mexico text where they approach a much more refined, difficult problem, which is, sorry, but women also want to fuck. Why not? Uh, although I don't totally agree with the thesis of my good friend, Yanis Varoufakis, that capitalism is dead. We are entering neo-feudalism. Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Left. Today we have with us a very special guest, Slavoj Zizek. Slavoj, welcome to India and Global Left. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. I am honored to be here. I have uh, a lot of things to discuss with you, but if you don't mind, can you just uh, give us a little bit of background about the kind of uh family you uh were born in or what interested you what when did you become a hegelian so to speak what were the kind of things that you read and i think that would be a good preface to some of the to understand some of the things that we would eventually plunge into let's not lose too much time i would just like to mention the basic why not call it like this paradox uh i think my so-called international career, the fact that people, many people know me in academic circles, of course, is mostly due to the paradoxical character of Yugoslav version of whatever you call it, communism, really existing socialism. Because uh, on the one hand, I don't have these illusions of many Western intellectuals that Yugoslavia was nonetheless something special. It was non-aligned. It was not the same uh, hardline bureaucratic socialism as in other East European countries. Yes, there were considerable differences. For example, from early 60s, borders to the West were completely open. Even somewhere I would say in the mid-60s, the ruling Communist Party renounced to an official, not so much ideology as philosophy. It was no longer dialectical materialism. Yes, you should maybe pay a little bit lip service to Marxism, but de facto, there were Marxists who were to be classified more as Western Marxists, Frankfurt School and so on. There were analytical philosophers, there were phenomenologists and Heideggerians. Why am I mentioning this? Because as a student of philosophy, you had a choice. It wasn't just a choice between being, uh, let's call it, dissident, you ruin your career and you follow the party line, you have to choose which party line you prefer. Paradoxically, in diff from after 1974, republics, six or however they were, republics of Yugoslavia got more economic, but especially intellectual independence. And this brings me to a nice paradox. In different republics, there was a different philosophical orientation, which was still closest to the power structure. In Slovenia, it was Frankfurt School Marxism, which is a beautiful paradox, like your job was threatened if you criticized Horkheimer or Marcuse too much. <laughs> <laughs> 
in Croatia, an even more beautiful paradox. It was Heide Heidegger's thought, which was closest to the, well, Communist Party intellectual life. Why? They didn't like Marxism because in, in Croatia, Marxism was dominated by the Praxis group, who were more too much Western Marxist and critical towards the establishment. In Serbia, even more interesting, it was analytical philosophy. You know why? Because there, they liked this old style depoliticized analytical thought where you didn't analyze concrete social situation. But you know, this more abstract language analysis, what is the meaning of a sentence? Uh, can we determine it objectively? And uh, of course, the communists like this, you know why? Because uh, they didn't see a threat. They knew that that type of philosophy cannot trigger a social movement in the sense of finding a great eco in social circles. So if you want to make a career there, it was uh, best to be an analytical philosopher. So we had a choice. In Slovenia, the basic opposition that predominated philosophy when I was young, Analytical philosophy was also beginning, but it was some kind of a Frankfurt School Marxism, more or less official thought, and Heideggerian dissidents, but not too strong uh, dissidents. They still were able to publish books. That's why my whole generation was formed by the big explosion of so-called structuralism, post-structuralism in France. It was a breath of fresh air for us. It, we always considered Heideggerians and uh, Frankfurt School Marxists part of the same camp. The opposite poles, but within the same field, we wanted to break out. So again, we found this way out in so-called new French thought. Uh, we refer to all of them, but in Slovenia specifically, Jacques Lacan's psychoanalysis begin to predominate in our circle. Uh, now, uh, this is the good influence of my environment. The bad one, uh, this beautiful irony, is that not only official philosophers, but also Heideggerians hated us. They often attacked us in similar terms even. So I had trouble when there was what I call the last moment of the, the Indian summer of communism. Things got harder in the 1970s. I finished my postdoctoral studies in 73. And I wasn't able to get a job. I was for four or five years unemployed. It wasn't a terrible situation. I earned enough money uh, through translations. My parents supported me and so on. But what's the irony is that in this way, since I was isolated here, I began to look for contact abroad. First in France with Lacanians, then in England with Ernesto Laclau, some other people, and so on. So now I'm coming, and then I will stop to my ironic result. Uh, without communist oppression in the early 70s and throughout the 70s, I can tell you exactly who I would have been. I would have gotten a post at Ljubljana University at the Department of Philosophy. I was already I was already in that position. I had to fill out forms, but then I was prohibited. So the point is that without the last wave of communist oppression, I would have been 
probably an unknown professor of philosophy here in Slovenia. Because, you know, to be a professor of philosophy at a philosophy department, lots of teaching obligations and so on and so on, I wouldn't have time to do all my studies, writings and so on. After a couple of years of unemployment, I got around 1980 a job at a small research institute, which was also a blessing. Because research insti this research institute were a place where the communists in power put intellectuals whom they considered not too dissident, you were not yet arrested or what, but intelligent enough, so they gave you a niece to do your work without too much contact with the public. This was a paradise for me. It meant I had no fixed obligations even to stay here. I, it was possible for me to be absent from Slovenia for a whole year and the salary went on. So that's the most I can say. It's a beautiful irony. Without the moderate communist oppression, I would have been an average professor here and so on, nobody. So my gratitude is paradoxically to the key event is the moderate but still pretty strong uh, uh, communist oppression in the 70s. Feels like you're a real Marxist in the sense that a crisis was actually very instrumental in terms of who you became, like if not for being unemployed, probably. Yeah, but I was also a Leninist here in the slightly ironic sense, because, you know, now I wrote another text short on Lenin, where I admit Lenin did many things which appear to us today terrifying. I never followed this line. If just Lenin were to die, a little bit later, then Stalin would be overthrown. There would have been a totally different Soviet Union. Maybe, maybe not. I don't idealize Lenin. But what I like in Lenin and what is still actual for us today is whenever an unexpected new situation emerged, Lenin was had an incredible ability to quickly totally rethink the situation, to see how the coordinate radically changed. Lenin was never orthodox in the sense of following an abstract Marxist dogma. He was, I like this term and I mean it in a positive way, he was a principal pragmatist, a principal even opportunist. He followed unconditionally his principles. But he was at the same time extremely plastic, pragmatic about what to do. For example, the outbreak of First World War was a shock to Lenin. First, he didn't believe this could happen. Not the war but the fact of how practically all social democratic parties in Sorry. Europe became. took the patriotic line, with the exception of Russian Bolsheviks, and one has to say this, especially with regard to what Serbia became later, and the Serb Social Democratic Party. These were the only two bright spots at the beginning. And then Lenin, some people hold this against him, behaved in a totally pragmatic way. His aim was not a nationalist victory. His aim was revolution in Russia. And when he saw this option after the February Revolution overthrew the Tsar, but at the same time brought to power, one should not forget, brought to power a moderate Marxist, Menshevik regime. Uh, uh, Kerensky was a dogmatic Marxist. 
he followed this line. There cannot be a revolution in Russia because we don't get enough of a working class. We know the line. The, uh, the uh, revolution can only happen when the relations of productions are developed enough. They, they, the Mensheviks followed this dogmatic historicist line. History is linear. You cannot jump over. First, you have to do the bourgeois liberal revolution, then slowly you go on. Lenin immediately perceived a chance because of this, a chance for a revolution, because of what he saw to mistakes, which is the government pursuing the war. They didn't want to step out of the war, the Menshevik government, from February till October 1917, plus uh, farmers were dissatisfied. The government didn't do anything practically to break up large, almost feudal uh, 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 structure uh, of, uh, on the land of, of uh, 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 big farmers and so on. So it's interesting, we tend to forget Lenin's slogan in October 1917 was not working class, power to working class. It was bread, peace, peace and land. It was peace and land. You see? And land, bread. Uh, peace, land, I and bread. Sorry? peace, land, and bread. And bread. And bread. Yeah, but bread again meant because that because of the war confusion again there were there was hunger and all that. So what I admire with Lenin is that he was he had this incredible instinct to see a chance to grab a unique moment. Lenin said, if we miss this opportunity now. The chance of a revolution is lost for 30 years, even more. And uh, it's interesting how, when he wrote his famous Lenin, April Thesis, in 1917, outlining this chance of a revolution, do you know that even his wife, Nadezhda Krupskaya, wrote to, I don't know to whom, that uh, Vladimir Ilyich is getting into some kind of a strange uh, 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 psychic state. Maybe he needs a doctor or whatever. And even Stalin and so on, all those were against Lenin, considered him a utopian. So what I'm saying is that today, I'm not now playing nostalgia for Lenin. I'm not saying we should return to his formula of central party organization and so on. What I'm saying is that a similar thinking is necessary today without any prejudices. You know, for example, uh, although I don't totally agree with the thesis of my good friend Yanis Varoufakis that Capitalism is dead. We are entering neo-feudalism. Techno-feudalism. Sorry, techno-feudalism, yes. Uh, there are too many things which I don't totally agree, but I think he did clearly perceive a certain tendency. You know what, for me, this may amuse you and some of your readers. The paradox is that I hope your listeners, your public, knew about Varoufakis's idea of techno-feudalism. Yeah, we, we did a full book discussion on, on his book, Techno-Feudalism. Yeah. Do you know that there are some people around Donald Trump who like his book? You know how they read it? At some part... Uh, in some parts, Varoufakis says that in today's typical constellation, you have a big corporation who doesn't exploit only workers, but also, he doesn't use the term, but I use it in a consciously naive way, small creative inventing 
capitalism. You know, because uh, it's not only as a book buyer that you have to go through Amazon. It's also the, under quotation marks, capitalists here, the big publishers. They know if you ignore Amazon, it, it can mean the end for you in our kind of books that me and my friend produce, humanities, philosophy. In United States, I was told uh, uh, Amazon covers 60 to 70 percent of the sale. So again, both old-fashioned capitalists who still produce stuff, even if it's intellectual stuff, and workers we are all exploited by these neo-feudal corporations. So at some point, when she evokes possibilities of what to do, uh, Varoufakis even mentions, and I'm not opposed to it. I like, this is a typical Leninist procedure. He said, why not strategically risk a, a, a pact, temporary pact? between ordinary exploited workers and, let's call it, creative capitalists who are both oppressed by big corporations. Then another option I would propose here, but how to do it, is to, in some sense, not necessarily nationalize, but uh, socialize this mega corporation. Because in some other sense, their ultra-centralization provides a machinery for strong social action. Why not simply chop off, not physically, the head and install in these big corporations from Amazon to Microsoft and so on, some kind of social control and this is a moment which also always fascinated Lenin. You know that it's interesting to follow what Lenin was doing in those days, years, a couple, after the end of the Civil War, 21, and before his, not only that, but a year before, incapacitation and so on. Lenin invited, or they came to Russia, many Western ultra rich corporate chiefs because the Soviet Union was in a desperate situation. They needed foreign capital investment collaboration. And Lenin maybe went a little bit too far. He had excellent relations with them because for them, big corporations were already a stop towards socialism creating a large organization, socialism. you just chop off the head and it's socialism. So Lenin, not only personally, these are wonderful details, enjoyed talking with them, telling some of them, but listen, you with your organizational skills, you would have functioned wonderfully in our Soviet system. Not only this, he even said that said that the main danger for him in 21, 22, 23 were not big capitalists, but the small bourgeois liberals, all these uh, individuals and uh, individualistically oriented entrepreneurs and so on. So I'm not saying we should follow here Lenin. I'm just saying that similar radical decisions have to be taken today. For example, uh, precisely with regard to what Varoufakis calls techno-feudalism. What to do? Uh, Varoufakis is well aware that the solution is not that we need to make a step back to more chaotic liberal capitalism through state intervention. But Varoufakis is aware of something that Lenin would have liked, namely that 
Do you know that from the 1920s onwards, free market survived only through extremely strong state interventions? Mm -hmm. Market left to itself would have abolished itself, tabulated itself in the Hegelian sense of Aufhebung already in the 1930s, especially in the 1950s. Every American Marxist will tell you this wonderful example. Uh, when transistor uh, portable radios, I mean simply, and TV sets exploded in the United States in the <coughs> early and mid-50s, one company got a monopoly of this technology. And the uh, American state immediately took from them the copyright, said, no, this technology should be free. Because if they were not to do it, it would be an incredibly oppressive monopoly. This thing, another thing, if you allow me to just finish, where I think we should be Leninist. And many people are mad at me if I say this. You know, I'm totally for decolonization and so on. But the constant, constant, not always, permanent failure, predominant failure of decolonization, independently of who won the decolonization process in the sense of which anti-colonial power took over, often ends in catastrophe. I always repeat this, maybe you know it, but the saddest thing for me that I heard in the last years, what, what I learned from an old African National Congress fighter, um, a beautiful old lady from South Africa, she told me, isn't this tragical, that more and more the predominant ideology among the black poor majority in South Africa is, I cry, is nostalgia for apartheid. Because in their view, apartheid was horrible. But there was order, you had a certain salary, your life, if you didn't mess in politics, of course, was relatively safe. And there was social safety, because, of course, it was a police state. Now, social differences are uh, higher than ever. You know that South Africa has the world record of a gap between rich and poor. All that socially happened is that the old white ruling class uh, is enlarged with the new black ruling class with incredible corruption, social chaos, signs of disintegration of law and order. And instead of playing the usual game of blame the whites, oh, this is because, no, let's ask why another country, Angola, where, as you probably remember, the communists led, supported from Cuba, opposition won, and it's also now a state of total division between new rich elite in Luanda, which is a modern European cities with Starbucks, all that bullshit, and, and the incredible poverty around. You see, this is a problem that we should approach without prejudices, not in the sense of, oh, colonization is better. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. But when decolonization went back, and now I will tell you another thing. I've written this in a text and got Kate mail as much as you want. You know that not because African and other countries are primitive, but because of the complex ethnic and religious situation exploited by those in power. Now I will say something to shock you and your public. Uh, moderate intelligent dictatorship, moderate, not madness, can do a better job than 
simply an appropriation of Western democracy. For example, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know what's happening there now, but in Rwanda, they have for the last two decades a guy, I forgot his name, who is a moderate dictator. But he did the job. He keeps absolutely under control the old conflict, you remember, between Tutsi and Hutu. It simply prohibited to play on this. Then economy is progressing. There is a limited freedom of the press. The situation is stable. And a black friend from there told me, imagine now this pure Western liberal democracy. The tragedy is that in a full multi-party system, in this situation, the parties would be for sure organized along ethnic lines, primarily. You see, that's for me uh, the Leninist approach. Totally pragmatic, but never losing out of sight the absolute seriousness of our situation. And it's the same for me with the problem of anti-Euro centrism. Your figure, whom I admire very much, Arundhati Roy, wrote something, not about India, but about the effects of the Gaza war. She said honestly that although Western human rights and all that were, of course, always hypocritical. But absolutely, always. There was never a golden era when the West took them seriously. It was always a tool for your own expansionist, whatever. But nonetheless, as Arundhati put it correctly, nonetheless, they serve as a kind of a moral compass to all. Precisely in seeing that they are hypocritical, they open up a way for self-critical rethinking. Like, the idea is not no human rights. The idea is, but let's take them more seriously. Let's see what does it mean to have human rights in a poor, oppressive country. This especially, so, and then she said something very sad, Arundhati. She says that, uh, that now with Gaza, react with Gaza, with how the West, which boasts with human rights, ignores what Israel is doing in Gaza, human rights even no longer work in this hypocritical way, so that you can still the good thing about hypocrisy, I more and more ab ab admire hypocrisy, is that it opens up to victims a place for criticism. You can say, but you are a hypocrite. Look, you are violating your own rules. So let's go. No. Now, I think human rights are violated there in such an open way. We have, as many people said, in Gaza, the first case in history of an open, okay, the term genocide is a little bit problematic, but basically it is genocide going on there. A first open genocide, we see it every day on TV and so on. And I think so, uh, I think that there, uh, that. Well, some leftists think, okay, wonderful, we see the Western discourse of human rights is over. I wouldn't be so glad about it because, okay, the alternative is BRICS. You know what I don't like in BRICS? Isn't that often in BRICS what you get is a kind of opportunistic coexistence in the sense of I tolerate your crimes, you tolerate my crimes. For me, as I often repeat, the model of BRICS is how Taliban taking over in Afghanistan and China immediately made a deal. The deal was, we 
Taliban tolerate how you are oppressing Muslims and that Uyghur, Uyghurs in that area, we, China, will ignore what you are doing with women and also on blah, blah, in, in Afghanistan. What I am afraid is that since today we live in a global era, what we are doing, uh, sorry, the problems we are facing, are by global warming, immigration problems, and so on, are global problems which cannot be solved at the level of local sovereign state. And my approach to non-Western countries who often, as a rule, in a justified way, criticize the hypocrisy of Western legacy, is that now many of them are copying, imitating what I found in today's situation, the worst part of Western legacy, which is a strong nation state. Maybe you can correct me here. I'm wrong. But your commander, Narendra Modi, with his idea to change the name of India to Bharat, with his more exclusive uh, emphasis on, uh, on uh, Hinduism and so on. I see in this a tendency towards homogenizing India into... Pre this, that's the cat. He is not returning to Indian tradition. The tradition was much more plural, mixed and so on. He's doing something in a bad sense, Western. He's the great Westernizer. Erdogan is doing the same in Turkey. Uh, even in China, now that they are oppressing uh, Uyghurs, Tibetans, more. Even China is now becoming, moving towards a Western style of nation state. So that's what I see as a dark prospect. Uh, strong ideologically, strong nationalist nation state, but which leave the global market totally undisturbed. If I know it correctly, under Modi, India is more than ever part of international market. Other even uh, in Slovenia, we have uh, 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 maybe I think even the biggest single company in Slovenia, it's called Kirka, the name of a river. It's a, a pharmaceutical company producing mostly pills, blah, blah, other medical stuff. And they want now to open up a factory in India. And even Indians are buying things here. So he is the model for me here, Modi. The model of this uh, the new global market, free flow of capital, but to guarantee, we all know that global capital is destructive of local cultural heritage, but to try to counteract here with stronger local nationalism, uh, uh, emphasis on local traditions and so on. And in this sense only, things are more complex. I never liked the leftists who used all too quickly the term fascism, you know. Basically, we often think use today the term fascism in a non-thinking way. We think there is something slightly authoritarian that you don't like. Oh, let's call it fascism. <laughs> no, but if we use the term fascism in a more general sense, what is fascism at its minimum? It, as they call it, conservative modernization. Mm -hmm. You want to enjoy the fruits of modernity, technological development, free market, but you are aware that this can destroy, destroy uh, the homogeneity, stability of social life. 
So to control this, you impose some cultural, political hegemony based on traditional values, which are always, as it is always with traditions invented. Now, you know, this, if we call in general sense, this country's fascists, it's not Nazism. They are not necessarily expansionist. I'm just talking about free market capitalism controlled by some traditional national sense of unity. This is why, although I wish the Chinese all the best, <laughs> this is what I see that effectively China is moving to after Deng Xiaoping reforms. It moves not in any bad sense. It moves from hardline Mao communism to fascism. Fascism in the sense that market functions with moderate, often also very rational state interventions, but with the state control, imposing cultural unity, trying to limit foreign influence, and so on, and so on. This is, I think, where we are moving. And I think, I will conclude, my God, I gave a whole speech. I think that even Trump, if he wins, United States will become another BRIC country. <laughs> because Trump was always for free capitalism, but stronger America, stronger local cultural identities, and so on and so on. I think this is a catastrophe, a mega catastrophe. Because uh, if the only thing that unites us is the free flow of capital, and otherwise we have full national cultural and so on sovereignty, how will we go with the problems that we have? Ecology. No, you cannot say you in India now, in some parts where in the south usually, no, in the city, how it is called now, which was once called Madras, I think. Yeah, it's it's called Chennai now. Yeah, yeah, Chennai, yeah. Didn't you have there a couple of times a terrible drought in well, summer yeah. and so on? Yeah. Okay, and but, flood, and flood in, in... Yeah, yeah, that's the paradox today. You have both. Yeah. But, you know, my God, uh, yeah. this is not Indian problem. The whole, the whole circulation of air, what we're doing with the sea and so on and so on. We have to approach this globally. And even I hope the developed countries, ultra developed, will discover this. For example, my eternal example, you remember three years ago, northwest of United States, southwest of Canada, Seattle, Vancouver. Yeah. At that point, that area in the summer, two and a half years ago, when was warmer than India and Emirates for some time. But again, you shouldn't blame them. Locally, they had a relatively good ecological measures. Is that the whole circulation of air around the northern pole is disturbed? So, and the same it is with immigration. That's why I don't see as a solution, in contrast to Western liberals, let's just open the borders. We are guilty. No, if you do this, you will get what is already happening in Europe. Uh, in in Italy, in Sweden, and elsewhere, the anti-immigrant right is taking over. The same may happen in France, Marine Le Pen, maybe even in Germany, uh, and so on. So uh, I think we should now, not in some imaginary future, address the problem, but why are people immigrating here? What be and also, how this immigration proceeds. You know that immigration is the big business of half immigrant organizations which exploit poor immigrants. Like it's well known from Turkey to Europe, 
the price is, I think, 5,000 euros and so on. So we have, we have to change the whole set of uh, economic uh, uh, interaction, relations, and so on. People tell me, but this is utopia. I tell them, okay, but then Europe will become neo-fascist in this sense of focused of, on national uh, uh, autonomy or uh, uh, or that's the paradox. If you want to keep borders relatively open, you will have to limit democracy. Like we all hate U Orban, the Hungarian president. But what can you tell him? How can you reject him as a if you are a Democrat? when he and in Poland also want to organize a big referendum asking people, do we have to go on allowing immigrants to arrive into our country? This is the sad thing. The majority is against. So right-wing anti-immigrant populists have a point when they say, Millions of foreigners arriving to our country. This is a big decision. So the majority has nothing to say about it or whatever. You know what I mean? Here, a Leninist spirit is required. This rethinking without any prejudices, the new uh, constellation. Even in India, my sympathies there were... Uh, were uh, were, of course, as expected from me, pretty radical. I admire individuals like Arundhati Roy. I even have, I don't plan to go to India now, so I hope he will not be arrested. Do you know that I had a certain contact with uh, Maoists in Nepal and mm -hmm. with Naxalit guys in your country? Although, unfortunately, my problem with Naxalit is that I don't think they have the potential to become a really predominant power. They are a limited movement. And the big problem is if Modi will succeed in his relatively Relatively, you should tell me this if this is true. But is he nonetheless, although poverty persists and so on, I know. But economically, in abstract terms, in abstract terms, which means it doesn't matter if people are dying there, but in overall statistic, India is developing, modernizing itself. Mm -hmm. What can the left do here? It's a serious problem. The left is today effectively, de facto. The left has two facets. Now I'm not talking about India. I don't know enough. I'm talking about so-called developed Western countries. The left, on the one hand, uh, uh, is still in love with all social democratic ideas, like let's try to save whatever possible of the welfare state. Sorry, that's not enough. This is why, incidentally, Biden's inauguration was a fake. Biden's victory over Trump was pure conservative nostalgia. Not conservative in the political sense, mm -hmm. but conservative in the sense of let's return to a glorious past before that monster Trump appeared. No, my answer is Trump is secondary. No, he's extremely dangerous. But we should never forget that Trump emerged because of the failure of the predominant, relatively progressive American welfare state uh, project and so on. You know, so one and second element, this so-called uh, cancel culture vote left. This culturalization of economic class 
issues. I totally support feminist struggles, LGBT, and so on and so on. I'm just saying that if they are not closely linked with other social struggles, they de facto became an element of the ruling class to keep under control the poor. For example, in the United States, they will not tell you publicly, but I noticed immediately the hidden class dimension of political correctness. It's usually always the poor Mexicans and so on who are not enough feminists and so on and so on, while uh, uh, the big corporations are like political correctness. You know, you fire one of the big uh, managers because he made an inappropriate remark Social, you change nothing, but you can sell yourself as progressive. Cut me off. You don't play your game of being my domina with a black whip. Go on. With yeah. yeah. Because, no, you, know, uh, you know, a guy in Slovenia attacked me in a totally correct way. He said, how do you make a long one-hour interview with Zizek? You ask him one question. <laughs> Let's try not to follow this model totally. Yeah. Please counterattack. What is I want to learn from you? I as apart from this general sympathy for parts of India. For example, I was in uh, uh, Kerala, and there. Okay, we can debate. Are they radical enough? But. There, this very moderate part of the establishment communist did a relatively good job. Relatively, one can debate it. Wasn't it the same even in Bengal? Till now, communists were for a long time in power there also. Until 2011. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but isn't it that they didn't do it so bad that... Almost for the first time in history, I read, under communist rule, Bengal became self-sufficient in producing mm -hmm. food. But then I was told that communists, as they always are, became too obsessed with progress. Progress for them means socialized, uh, 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 abolishing small farms, uh, larger farms. And so you had thousands of suicides of small farmers. It was, it was a tragedy. Also, I read another detail. Can you tell me yes or no? An Indian friend told me this fascinated me, that, that it was part of the Congress party politics, because Congress party practically never controlled uh, uh, Kolkata, mm -hmm. the old Calcutta. The, that's why they tolerated their mother Teresa. It fitted them that Kolkata became the symbol of Indian misery because mm -hmm. it was not their Congress party, you know. That, that, and I incidentally, I don't know how you do it, but I follow here the line of Christopher Hitch Hitchens and others, knowing enough about Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. I tend to agree that she was a largely negative, evil person, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you disagree with me here? Please. I think, uh, yeah, there are a couple of points, but I would pick up on the fascism thing. Um, I think you began by saying that we should not use the fascism word loosely, which I completely agree with. But then you went on and say that the Deng period was fascism because there was this kind of a combination of perhaps uh, or, or a toleration of, of, of market and some kind of state action. But I think fascism, it's, it's hard to understand fascism if you just look at the political economy, because if you look at Germany in the 1930s. Oh, Germany is Nazism, it's different. I think, unfortunately, sorry to interrupt you, that you can also have a 
sorry for this obscene expression, uh, soft fascism, which doesn't need anti-Semitism. I don't mean just Jews here, I mean uh, a foreign intruder group on which you can project the cause of disorder. Look at the Portugal. Look even up to a point. Franco's dictatorship, at least for till early mid-50s, was extremely brutal. Look even at Mussolini. Uh, so first, we shouldn't put all the fascisms together. Mm -hmm. You can have a relatively modern fascism, but I agree with you that maybe another name should be invented. No, authoritarian capitalism is too abstract. What would you say? Okay, I'm asking you. You are a couple of thousand miles closest to the place. I know it's very specific why Singapore is such an economic success. Because precisely, it became a nodal point for the undeveloped area around. But Singapore would have fit my definition, or very broad definition, and I want to overcome the term of fascism, because it's, again, economically liberal efficient, but politics is controlled. They are upset. I know, I was there, I spoke with some people close to the government. They are obsessed with preventing any kind of public political debate. For example, I almost like this. You have there uh, Chinese, Confucianists, Hindus, blah, blah, blah. And I was told that it's not only prohibited in the public media to attack other religions, it's even prohibited to write long in public, popular media, long text advocating your religion. Because in their view, this may provoke an answer. All you can do in big public media is said, tomorrow in that church, in that temple, there will be this ritual. But uh, it's a kind of a thing which functions. I, I am not saying we should follow it, because it functions only with the relative stability of international global market and so on and so on. But, uh, okay, then I will tell you, ask you another thing, and that's what makes me sad. Look at Latin America and Africa. Show me one example. I have one or two where the left really succeeded. One case would have been uh, uh, would have been uh, uh, Lula. It's modest left, but I spoke with radical leftists who said, but he did many things which worked. For example, a beautiful paradox. You know there are slums in big cities, Rio de Janeiro, favela. Do you know that he, under Lula, they invested so much in making life conditions better in favelas, mm -hmm. water, electricity? You know what's the result? Some of the favelas are now so gentrified that they are too expensive for the poor. <laughs> you know? exactly. But nonetheless, he did it. Then the only authentic miracle that I see is Bolivia. Whatever you say about Evo Morales, especially people around him, Alvaro Garcia Linera, his vice president, and Lucho Arce, who is now president, they did an authentic economic miracle. Production grew, standard of the ordinary people really went up, and they did it in an intelligent way with pressures but not oppression, so to prevent the flight of the capital outside. But unfortunately, I think that in Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba, they really screwed it up. This cannot be a model. So, you know, 
what I expect from the left is not just this nostalgia for welfare state and at the same time this obsession with uh, cultural issues. Like I look, it already happened to me. Uh, I, I I just had, I didn't look really at the woman. It just appeared because I had tears in my eye. I wasn't able to see clearly. I was accused of visual ray. Just <laughs> looking at, I'm not saying all this should be spoken, addressed to openly, but I think the whole point of Me Too had, and probably it was totally different in India, in the West, had this class dimension. Would you agree or not with this? That a typical scene about which uh, Me Too debated all the time is the famous only yes means yes. Woman, somebody wants to have sex with a woman. What kind of pressure he puts on her? That is it. Uh, is it uh, uh, direct or indirect? Uh, financial or because of his uh, position of domination, pressure, and so on and so on. But this, for me, means that the typical situation they describe is what I called a date in a public place in a bar. You know, you mingle there and so on and so on. Uh, I, the first thing I would do, I would have done is to, to expand the region of women's suffering. Why talk about this young free women who, okay, they had sex once under pressure, but then you can get out. What about in Mexico, friend, well, drew my attention to this. What about, imagine a woman in her mid-30s to use a male chauvinist language, losing a little bit of her sexual attraction for a simple reason, because in a marriage she has three children, works all the time, and the husband is losing interest in her. She doesn't have a job. What can she do? That's true despair. She has nowhere to go. What hope is there in her life? This is the true despair of millions. My God, you know. So I would just broaden the scope, not of these typically upper middle class problems. She put his arm on uh, his hand on my arm. Wasn't this already a pressure? Yeah, I agree with all of this. But my God, let's look at millions of uh, people who, women who actually suffer and so on. So I would like to know what goes on here. I don't know in India because, for example, I discovered that in South Korea, they had years ago a strong Me Too movement, but totally different from the uh, European and American one. These were hundreds of thousands of women protesting on the street. It was focused on some phenomenon which I find really disgusting. There was a whole fashion, in a bad sense, in South Korea of men. Let's say you have a girlfriend, you take some intimate photos of her, and then these photos were circulating uh, on Facebook or whatever, and so on. It was a mass movement. And what I like about Mexican feminism is that they don't play this sexually conservative game, how for a woman to defend herself, which brings the impression as if Women really don't want sex, only exceptionally sex is always preferred. I read wonderful Spanish from Mexico text where they approach a much more refined, difficult problem, which is, sorry, but women also want to fuck. Why not? And it's much more dangerous and humiliating for a woman how to enact her desire without appearing a cheap whore or what? You know, it is as if this is the silent presupposition 
shared by some of the politically correct, mm-hmm. me too, people and the conservatives, that the role of the woman is to be passive. The ultimate obscenity is a woman who, you know, we all protest against uh, men objectivizing women, you know. This is totally wrong lesson because, first, male sexuality is much more aggressive and humiliating. You don't want just to objectify a woman when you exert pressure on her. You want, at the same time, for her to feel humiliated, which is a subjective feeling. No, because one of the ways I spoke with many women who were victims, they told me that when they were raped, they simply, ah, okay, fuck me, I don't care, and didn't even move. The guy beat them even more. The guy said, no, I want you at least to resist. I want you to be alive, you know. So we shouldn't be afraid of all. And I would love to know the situation in India about all this. You know, because I know that in the Western press, when we write about India or whatever, we often... uh, uh, where, uh, how should I put it, uh, 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 it's often in a maybe not openly, but nonetheless, between the lines, racist, patronizing way. It's very comfortable for us to depict oppression of women there. Would you agree or not? What really shocked me is, you remember some, when we did, more than five years ago, ten, A young woman was raped by five people publicly in a bus in New Delhi. Oh, yeah, 2012. And all the people uh, were shocked. It was reported in all our media. But then an Indian leftist friend told me, wait a minute, you missed the key point. She was a middle-class girl by mistake finding, finding herself there in a bus usually for lower class people, so that people ignored that the horror was also that of the middle class attacked by lower classes. And they, uh, I was told that much worse things are happening regularly in Mumbai, that you have there the whole agencies who organize from poor parents, farmers, desolate, in northern India, in Nepal. You buy five, six years old children, boys, girls, as slaves and from the family and sell them and so on. So you see, what is reported as horrible case is often reported, but the whole set of unwritten rules, censorship is at work. So when I'm critical about Me Too, It's not they go too far. No, they don't go far enough. There is a lot of everyday violence which is simply taken as a part of life. Listen, we will have to finish, so give me another question at least. Yeah, um, I had so many questions, like, but probably just to keep, I think, uh, yeah. this as a segment and we can then later yeah. on uh, take ah, a do it again in two months or whatever yeah. if you want. No yeah. Problem. So, yeah. yeah, so just to keep things in, um, mm. in, a, in a more compact mm. uh, manner, probably, I think. Um, so the Leninist influence, I think, is pretty clear insofar as you want some sort of order and there is sort of a, um, you know, desire to think through about uh, how a society should look like. But then I also see in you a almost, if not cynicism, a skepticism in in popular social movements, which is in so many ways very anti-Leninist. I mean, you can say post, post-revolution post Lenin would be much more uh, cynical instrumentally because he would call for order. But then pre-revolutionary Lenin would be very, very pro-social movements. In fact, part of fascination with Lenin instead of Trotsky in the global South is because Lenin was always more optimistic in the uh, actions of small peasants, which 
unfortunately trotsky was not as much trotsky was much more dogmatic in this in, the, in his belief that they are driven by this cultural obscurantism and so on and so forth but lenin was wholeheartedly he thought that th there are pathways of revolution through small peasantry uh, and so on and so forth uh, i and no, so sir, is, then, just just to then conclude just sorry. to conclude uh, would you say then that's your cynicism is an is an effect of the Frankfurt School or even the French post structuralist theory theorists who are often very, to my reading at least, and you can correct me. And there are exceptions. Like I would say, Marcuse was much more uh, action oriented. I see much more cynicism in Adorno, for instance. So would you say your cynicism to social movements and actions uh, is partly because of? Uh, your influence uh, from Frankfurt School and no, no, I, I, I am deeply, you know where I am deeply critical on Frankfurt School? At two levels. First, did you notice how Frankfurt School is obsessed by fascism, neo-fascism, anti-Semitism, and so on? But they almost totally ignore Eastern European capital, uh, uh, communism, Stalinism, and so on. They, there is a short book by Marcuse, Soviet Marxism, which doesn't do the job. It's just the analysis of the effects of Khrushchev's speech. But why did they totally ignore, let's call it Stalinism? Because Stalinism is a true example of what they call dialectic of enlightenment. How? an emancipatory project of enlightenment can go wrong. That's my first problem with them. My second problem with them is one incredible, not contradiction, but a gap. At the level of general theory, they see our world as moving towards what, what Marcuse called one-dimensional man of what? Adorno and Horkheimer called Verwaltete Welt, administered world, world totally technocratically manipulated with people still free, but nonetheless, it's a apparent freedom, totally controlled, manipulated. So, on the one hand, they accept this, let me call it almost Teleology, the whole point of dialectic of enlightenment is that humanity as such. Already, they, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer speak there about first superstitious acts, like if we burn this, uh, if we kill a victim or an animal sacrifice, then there will be rain, you know. So, uh, my, their idea is that from the very beginning, so called primitive society, there is this dimension of manipulating things to profit from manipulation. And that this arrives at an extreme in the in today's one-dimensional world. But at the same time, with it's very important, I agree with you, with uh, the exception of Marcuse, who did show sympathy even with uh, Vietnam opposed, uh, uh, opposed uh, American in Vietnam and so on. All others, nonetheless, whenever there was a concrete anti-imperialist movement in the third world, they took sight of the Western developed world. For example, when Max Horkheimer was in 66, seven, invited by students to participate in Frankfurt in demonstrations against U.S. Army. You know what was his answer? It preserved the pig that no, whenever U.S. Army intervenes, it brings freedom and progress. Adorno was even gave even a more ridiculous excuse. He said. I wouldn't feel well because I'm old and fat and I would appear stupid to be there. So you see this paradox. Generally, you think our society is the lowest point, one-dimensional, blah, blah, blah. 
at the same time, when there is any threat towards this society, you choose this society. It's a, I, I think, for example, a friend told me, a friend who read all that Habermas wrote, Habermas, who is now de facto, let's say it, the state philosopher of Western Europe. He, uh, <coughs> you would never ha have guessed from his old writings that there are two Germanys, East and West Germany. They, and the excuse I get from third school partisans is that they didn't want to criticize the East European communism because in this way they would appear to be engaged in the Western Cold War. No, this is too simple and stupid excuse. As to your second point, I follow here a formula of Horkheimer which I like, which is a pessimist in theory, optimist in practice. I like to be Generally, I think this was the this was originally an idea of Roman role, and I might be wrong. And then Gramsci also picked up and ah, I didn't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, my idea is this one: that uh, whenever there is a concrete situation with all the risk that it was of an actual movement, one should engage in it. Because even if the movement fails in its immediate goals, it leaves a trace. Mm -hmm. You know, like democratic socialists, so-called in America, I don't ide idealize them. But it's clear that you remember that, uh, that Occupy Wall Street movement. It failed. But without that movement, there wouldn't have been democratic socialists today, which are marginal, but not so absolutely marginal. They did something, uh, Bernie Sanders and so on, incredible for the United States. They rehabilitate the word socialism. Till that point, socialism was excluded. So uh, let me give you some examples. I actively intervened, and I was even pretty popular on state TV. I somehow managed to read spe uh, speeches in support of all these elections in in Chile, when uh, when uh, when uh, how it is called uh, Gabric Gabric, the president of Croat Origins, when he won, I was totally engaged. I think I was engaged for uh, uh, Lucio Arce to win when uh, uh, Moralista uh, uh, no, Morales people got reelected. I was engaged in Colombia when I forgot his name, this new guy, when the left won there. Mm -hmm. I was engaged, even people forget, for Aristide in Haiti. If there is a mega tragedy, colonialism at its worst is Haiti. Even now, the West did not pardon Haiti to be the first successful slave rebellion. A rebellion with its worst, which was not some, oh, let's return to our primitive roots. No. French Revolution, they were the anti hypocrites. They said, we also want to be. And here you see, like French revolutionaries, and here you see the truth about France. Only Jacobins fully supported them, immediately recognizing them as equal. Napoleon, we know what he did. Right. He said, kill them all. He even said, it's not enough to defeat them, but kill them all and bring new slaves. And you know who also uh, didn't show his nice face here? The so much celebrated, most democratic figure of uh, American War of Independence, Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. He said to Saint Louverture, half animal, no business. So, and then not to mention Syriza. I suspected, I wrote about it, the day will fail. But it was a miraculous event. Nonetheless, Syriza, you know in what sense? It was not an ordinary political party. It was a party which organically 
grew out of dozens of feminist, consumerist, farmers, local movements. The tragedy was that when they had to make a compromise with Europe, mm -hmm. they themselves destroyed their own basis, even using police against it. This is a mega tragedy, but it was like they were not extremists. Here, Varoufakis convinced me when he was finance minister, he he was very careful in economic measures. He didn't spend money like crazy and so on and so on. He was very pragmatic. Nonetheless, it was too much. So again, no, whenever concretely something happened, I fully engaged myself. In India, oh, another place, uh, India, no, sorry, uh, 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 Kurdistan, Kurds. I even wrote a speech praising Ocalan, their leader, who now not only renounced violence, but in prison, discovered feminism, postmodern theory, and so on. I learned that he reads me. It's crazy. And then, do you know that in Philippines, I have its influence. There are some leftist movements who I will try to go next summer there. So I prefer this position again of generally be pessimist, but not in a religious sense. Expect miracles. Miracles happen. Like Teresa, who would have expected something like that? A genuine born out of civil society political movement uh, won so-called free elections and so on. So uh, uh, there are problems. There are no easy long-term solutions. But I am not saying, you know, I put it like this. My good friend, now I don't have such good relations with him, Alain Badiou. That was my conflict with him because he is for me too much what I call, not in Leninist sense, principled opportunism. Whenever there was an actual movement, his idea was, no, this is not the real thing. They will fail. We have to wait for real revolutions. That's why, for example, he was against Theresa. He said, this is nothing. Ignore them and so on. No, my idea is Wherever something moves, support it, even if you fail. I believe in historical, not explicit memory, but efficiency. Even the great defeats leave a trace. So, uh, as Rosa Luxemburg said, there is never the right time for a revolution. Correct. By acting too early in a wrong way, you create the conditions maybe for a right moment. I just don't want this uh, cheap optimism, you know. All right. No, uh, under the proviso of, my idea is this one, to say, things will probably go wrong, but probably. There is a space for a miracle, maybe not. And from that, we should engage ourselves unconditionally. Sorry, I have to stop now. I will collect. No. But please uh, contact me in like a month or two. I promise you we do it again. is Ayushman. I, along with Jyotisman, have started this platform. In the last two years, we have tried to build content for the left and progressive forces. We have interviewed economists, historians, political commentators, and activists so far. If you have liked our content so far and want us to build an archive for the left, I have two requests for you. 
please do consider donating for the cause link is in the description below also if you are not able to do so don't feel sad you can always like our videos and share our videos to your comrades finally don't forget to hit the subscribe button